Hey Sluice, welcome back to Cold Case Study. As always, I'm your host Morgan, and my devilish co-host Houdini is around here somewhere, and I'm sure he'll make his presence known at some point during our case today, aka right now as he is tearing through my roommate's book bag. In a very nice, kittenly way. Before we get into things, I have a special shout out to Murder Vibes, the podcast. I've talked about them before, and I love their show so much, and I know you will too. Kira and Angela, co-hosts and best friends, they cover underreported cases that you probably won't hear from the rest of us in the true crime community. They're also way better at uploading than I am, releasing a new case every Wednesday. So make sure you tune in and help them solve cases. I know you can do it, Sluice. Today, we're going to Australia. Not physically because, one, this is a podcast, and two, because we're still in a pandemic and international travel is frowned upon. Speaking of COVID-19, however, please have empathy and wear a mask to protect those around you. Also, wash your hands, because why weren't people doing that before the pandemic? Like, isn't that what they teach you in, like, preschool? Wash your hands? Anyways, today's case is on Mr. Cruel. This screwed-up guy has been wanted since 1987, when his attacks on children began in the suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. Mr. Cruel has never been identified, but I know someone out there has information on this case. So top off your coffee and grab your sleuth book because today we're diving straight in and I've only got one question for you. Can you help solve this cold case? Warning, the following audio contains adult content, mentions of rape, child rape, kidnapping, and child murder. Listener discretion is advised. To prepare yourself for what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to read to you a quote of what Mr. Cruel said to his first confirmed victim, who has never been publicly identified. Quote, My liberty, my freedom, is more important than your life. End quote. Just let that sink in for a moment before you choose to continue listening. Before Mr. Cruel would ever come into contact with his first confirmed victim, criminal psychologist Tim Watson Monroe, who worked on the case, claims that there were adult victims, including an elderly nun who he held captive for hours while he raped her. The idea that was floated on why Mr. Cruel went from forcibly detaining adult women and raping them to attacking children when usually those attracted to prepubescence are very particular and only attack children who match their preferred demographic, is that the man we call Mr. Cruel became desensitized to the violent and horrific acts he was committing and needed to add a new layer of sadism to receive satisfaction from his crimes. Of course, since Mr. Cruel has never been identified, It is a tentative but substantial connection between these attacks on older women and children. Mr. Cruel was not a serial killer like many of our killers we have covered so far. It seems that taking a life wasn't in his plan, but not all things go to plan. What do you think could push someone who is already committing horrific crimes such as rape against children to kill? Think about it and... Write it down in your sleuth book for later, because we'll sadly get there in the case. But now we move on to the children, so take a deep breath and continue when you're prepared. On August 22nd, 1978, in Lower Plenty, a low-density suburb dominated by large homesteads that are built away from the main roads, an unnamed family was sound asleep. But they were not alone. At 4 a.m., a man wearing a black balaclava with white stitching around the eyes and mouth. It's terrifying, and the picture is in the case notes on my Instagram. This man broke into their home, armed with a gun and a knife. This man, Mr. Cruel, cut the phone lines and proceeded to tie the hands and feet of the parents, locking them in a wardrobe so that they couldn't stop what happened next. Their six-year-old son was tied to a bed, and then their 11-year-old daughter was raped. During this attack, he said the quote from the beginning of the show, which I will repeat now, quote, My liberty, 
my freedom is more important than your life, end quote. The 11-year-old would later tell police that Mr. Cruel forced her to brush her teeth before he assaulted her, something to write down in your sleuth book. I can only imagine the trauma that this whole family, let alone the 11-year-old herself, went through after this attack. But I want to pose an important question. How did Mr. Cruel know which house to attack in a suburb in which houses are usually off the main road? How did he know enough about the house to get to the parents' bedroom before anyone noticed he was inside? Mr. Cruel would not strike again, that we know of, for another year. In December of 1988, Julie Wills woke up to a man wearing a back balaclava with white stitching, pointing a gun at her. He proceeded to gag Julie and her husband, restraining them as well before entering the bedroom shared by their four young daughters. Ten-year-old Sharon Wills would later admit that she had been pretending to sleep when Mr. Cruel entered the room, probably hoping that it was all just a bad dream, that something was going bump in the night, like any ten-year-old would. But Mr. Cruel called Sharon by her name, calling her to him. He then covered her mouth and eyes with masking tape before taking her away. Julie and her husband, John, were desperate to save their abducted daughter and managed to break free from their bonds and called the police. Nearly 24 hours later, Sharon was found alive, outside of a school dressed in a man's shirt and trash bags. This was a forensic countermeasure police believed so that there would be no DNA on her clothing from Mr. Cruel himself. Sharon would also later tell police that her attacker made her shower and brush her teeth before he raped her, and had also fed and given her drink while she was held captive. He also required her to stay blindfolded for the entire 18 hours she was in his presence. This prompted Detective Chief Inspector Des Johnson to tell the media, quote, We can only dread what the man would have done if the girl had pulled off the blindfold and seen his face. It was that close to being a homicide, end quote. I asked you guys earlier to think what would push Mr. Cruel to kill. Do you think that this would have been it? If Sharon Wills had taken off her blindfold, do you think she would have been killed? It's a morbid question, I understand, but it does come up again later. Eighteen months later, Mr. Cruel would strike again this time in Canterbury, which is regarded as one of the most exclusive suburbs in, Mel in Melbourne. This time, Mr. Cruel broke into a house with two sisters, home alone for the night. Fiona Lyons, 15, was gagged and bound, and her sister Nicola, 13 years old, was abducted. Nicola was held hostage for several hours, being forced to brush her teeth before her assault while being fed like Sharon Wills had been during her time as a captive. From what the surviving vict victims of Mr. Cruel have told us, we know that Mr. Cruel is a Caucasian man, then between the ages of 30 and 50 years old, between 5'6 and 5'9, with a pot belly and light colored hair. He spoke with an Australian accent and used outdated words like Worry Wart, Bozo, and Missy when talking to his victims. Just painting a picture. If you guys have family that lived in Melbourne, Australia during these, this time period, just look back at them. Does anybody in those pictures look like the man that I have just described? Dr. Mallet, a forensic anthropologist and criminologist writing a book on Mr. Cruel, said this about him. Quote, Mr. Cruel was to be in his space, the zone he hunted in, and where he felt most comfortable, end quote. On this note, when she visited the site of the abduction, she noted, quote, He must have watched the victims, planned how to access them, watched and waited. He was clever, but he was also lucky and cunning, rat cunning. Hard to see these kids as prey, but that's what Mr. Cruel's eyes would have shown him. End quote. This plays into the question that I asked you guys earlier. How did he know these girls would be home? 
where their parents and siblings slept. He stalked them. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if he broke into their houses and got a feel for where everything was and everything would be when he came back to abduct these girls. I would also bet anything that he took them from, took something from inside the house. I mean, have you ever seen an cr- episode of Criminal Minds when the baddie didn't take a trophy? Because I haven't. So I would bet that... Ooh, Mr. Cruel has something, even if it's, like, as insignificant as a sock or a hair tie. You know, it's just something. An interesting thing to note, though, is that the first two victims had been mentioned in their local papers before the attack on them. Coincidence? Possibly, but unlikely. Nicola was also told during her attack that he had noticed her walking home from school. These poor girls were victims of what I would call an obsession. He saw them, and he had to have them in the most sinister way possible. But let's back up a second on to how organized Mr. Cruel was. He knew where they lived. He knew what rooms the parents and children slept in. He came prepared to gag and bind adults, and also with the necessary equipment to abduct his victims. He was not overtly violent and did not beat, bite, mutilate, or burn his victims, which is a reason I believe all of his victims lived. The assault was what he needed. He didn't need to kill the victims to receive satisfaction as yucky as this all is, which is why victim number four is so confusing to not only me, but to everybody studying Mr. Cruel's case. On April 13th, 1991, in Templestowe, Australia, Carmen Chan was babysitting her younger sisters. She was 13 years old, a perfectly acceptable age to be watching her nine and seven-year-old siblings for the evening, while her parents were working at the Chinese restaurant that they owned just 10 minutes away. At 9 p.m., the sisters found a man in their kitchen a man wearing a black balaclava with white stitching around the eyes and mouth. He forced the sisters into a wardrobe, blocking them in, and then abducted Carmen. Carmen's sister fought their way out of the wardrobe and informed the police and their parents of what happened, but they would never see Carmen alive again. One of the reasons people aren't so sure if this was actually Mr. Cruel is because he spray-painted, quote, payback, more to come, and Asian drug deal, end quote, on the side of one of Chan's car, the Chan family cars, which is weird because there wasn't, there weren't any messages at any of the other crime scenes, so why start then and with such a weird goddamn message? But four days before the one-year anniversary of Carmen's abduction, a dog walker found her skeleton in a shallow grave at the State Electricity Commission station about 10 miles from the Chan home. Investigators estimated that she had likely been dead since the night she was taken, or around, you know, that time. She had been shot three times in the back of the head. A striking de- deviation from the victims that came before Carmen. Had she taken off her blindfold like the detective said earlier? that that could have been what made him kill her? Did she fight him, harmed him, or is it not Mr. Cruel at all? I, in my honest opinion, I am very, I don't think that it was Mr. Cruel. Three gunshots to the back of the head seems like an execution. Not a killing of anger, you know, she had pulled off his mask or scratched him, bit him, whatever. You know, you're not going to turn the girl over and shoot her three times in the back of the head. If she's running away, you're going to aim for her torso, not her head. None of it makes sense that it was a planned thing to shoot and kill her. My understanding as well is that a rapist would have stabbed the victim to death, not shot them if they meant to kill their victim. But also, the spray painting on the car is a disconnect from the other crimes that I just can't get over. 
I think that it was probably a copycat, or if it was Mr. Cruel, that he had a personal relationship with the Chan family, and that's why he left the spray painting on the car to, you know, leave a message to the parents while also distancing himself from the crime. And maybe that's why Carmen had to die. Maybe she recognized him as a family friend or the neighbor or something like that. And it just was too much for him to go through with. Forensically speaking, there is no evidence. Like, none. Um, He made sure that all the girls were clean, that there was no DNA evidence on their clothing when they left his possession, um, that they had been blindfolded the whole time so they could give like absolutely no details about where they had been kept or who had kept them there. He was very sophisticated in that manner. So unless there's a push from the public, <laughs> you know, you guys and everybody else in the true crime community, there's been this type of sway before. Um, to get all the evidence re-examined with the newest forms of DNA testing um, or a person that comes forward with information because they go, oh, yeah, I kind of vaguely remember this, you know, nice guy with light blonde hair who was just like a little too interested in children and liked to use the word bozo and missy. Like, it doesn't sound likely, but it could definitely happen. Um, But unless something like this happens, I doubt that this case will be solved, which is why I want every single one of you to just think, 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 think. Do you know who this is? Do you know anybody who lived in Melbourne, Australia around this time that you could be like, hey, do you remember anybody like this? And this is where you come in. (laughs) Like, just think. This man could be anywhere from 70 to 90 years old now. He would have a collection of child pornography somewhere. He may even still have his distinctive balaclava. He lived or worked in Melbourne, Australia during the late 1980s and possibly the early 1990s. Someone out there knows exactly who this man is. So please, I've said it a million times already, but just think about it. And if you have any information that might be useful, please contact the Melbourne Police Department. And as always, I want to know what you have to say about this case. Do you think Carmen was a victim of Mr. Cruel? What do you make of the message left on the Chan's car? Why do you think he made his victims brush their teeth? Do you think he broke into their homes? Let me know by DMing me at cold case study on Instagram or Facebook or by emailing me at coldcasestudy at gmail.com. The case notes and resources for this case will be posted on my Instagram and Facebook pages where I offer m- links to my merch, to my case request form, and to my Patreon where support starts at just $1 a month. If you have a case that you want to hear from me, please, please, please go fill out that case request form. It helps me out a lot, and I love to see what type of cases that you guys want to hear. Keep your sleuth book handy, and I'll see you next Friday for another cold case. Big shout out to my first Patreon patron. He is a $2 sleuth for justice Um, His name is Travis. He is my older brother, and at the level that he is at, he will receive a handwritten thank you note, a sticker, a a Sleuth for Justice necklace or bracelet, and a shout out in an episode. So thank you so much, Travis, for always supporting me, for buying me this awesome mic that I'm recording with, and just letting me rant to you about a bunch of weird cold cases so thank you so much and if you want a shout out in an episode please just go on to patreon i have a bunch of different tiers the first one is one dollar a month and it is sleuth and you will get a shout out a sticker a custom thank you note and just knowing that your money is helping me keep content flowing while i am at college avoiding doing my homework Thank you all so much, and I will see you next week. Love you.